Okay, well, welcome everyone. Today will be uh, the first of three lectures covering the material for the final exam. The final exam is the sixth and final regular exam of the semester. It'll be another 80-point exam. It'll cover respiratory that we'll discuss today. It'll cover urinary that we'll discuss next Tuesday. And then uh, next Thursday, our last lecture together will be reproductive systems. So these three lectures will be the content on your final. It is not a cumulative final. It's just simply another um, unit exam. The vocabulary on this exam will be 93 to the end, uh, starting with urea. There's only about three more slides of actual vocabulary terms, and then after that, there are some abbreviations that you'll find sometimes in medical charts or on pharmacy uh, prescription, uh, prescription uh, orders, and so we'll go over those next time. And what else do I need to remind you about? Short papers are coming in. Over the weekend, my hope is to calculate your mastering grade. And I'll calculate it through the fifth exam. And I'll look at all the homework assignments, and I'll add up the points that you earned. And then I will look at the total points that were available. If you've made 80% or better up till this point, then I'll go ahead and put the 30 points into your grade center. If you haven't made the 80% mark and you have less than 30 points, I'll put that in the grade center. If you get all 30 points now, I'm not going to go back and reevaluate it. I want you to have all of your grades in. I'll try to get your short papers done also over the holiday so that when you get back next week, you know exactly you've got two grades left. You've got your lab exam and you have your um, final exam, right? The only thing that will be hanging on that would be your little PALS quiz, 10 points, and the little extra credit quiz from the last lab. But for the most part, you would have all of your grades in. You could make your goals and know exactly what grades you need to make. If you don't make all 30 points on mastering, then make sure you do the last four mastering assignments, and then I'll reevaluate that again at the very, very end. So hopefully most of you have been taking care of your mastering assignments and have been making about an 80% or better on all of them so that you'll get those points now and you can make your final goals. Okay, does that make sense for everyone? The, um, what else am I forgetting about? We got a few days off for Thanksgiving. Next week we get back, we'll have your lab exams uh, next week, and then the following week your, your final exam will be on Thursday, uh, sorry, Tuesday. Tuesday of finals week, I think that's December 9th, and your exam will start at regular class time at 4.30. And it is designed to be just another exam, but because it is a final exam, you'll have a little bit more time for it. The final exam blocks are two-hour blocks. So time certainly won't be an issue at all with the final exam. Okay. So let's start talking about the vocabulary for the sixth and final exam, starting with urea. urea. Uh, this is anything to do with the urine. And polyurea, as an example, would be excessive, much urination. Uh, vago, you saw the vagus nerve, right? The vagus nerve was the one that wandered down, cranial nerve number 10, wandered down to the gut. Uh, so vago refers to wandering. A uh, varic, an enlarged vessel, a varicose vein, right? Blood is accumulating in the veins. As you know, veins aren't able to withstand that pressure, and they sort of start to spread a little bit, and that gives you those full varicose veins uh, or spidery vein-type enlargements. Uh, vas, vessel, vasoconstriction, vasodilation. Usually we think of a blood vessel, but it can also refer to the vas deferens, the ductus deferens, the uh, duct for sperm. Down we go. Ventral. This one's familiar. Ventral, meaning toward the belly. Uh, vermi. Recall the appendix is sometimes called the vermiform appendix. You'll see it in some of the books because vermi means worm. So worm-shaped, a little appendix coming off the cecum. Uh, vertebral, the spine. And velo, hair. A single hair is a villus. And microvilli, I don't like the meaning. I don't like the, the word in a way because it suggests that microvilli are little hair-like structures. We know that they're not. Uh, they actually are just infoldings of the cell membrane, increasing the surface area, but it still is derived from the idea that they're little hair-like structures. Viscero, we know viscero means your internal organs. We take vitamins to maintain life, so vitae, life. Vitri, remember the vitreous humor? That glassy ball of jelly that came out from the posterior cavity of the eye. Vitri means glass. 
Um, if you hear about an experiment being done in vitro, it's being done in an artificial environment. It's being done in a glass test tube, perhaps. And if it's being done for the next word, in vivo, then the experiment's being done in a living organism. So in vitro versus in vivo, vivo referring to life. And then vol, volume. So hypovolemic, hypervolemic, something about volume. Finally, we end up with the last three for today. Zero, dry. Zero derma is dry skin. We go to the zoo to see the animals. Zoology, the study of animals. And we'll finish up with zyg, union of, pairing of. The zygote, the first, the first cell, right? The egg and sperm come together. The fertilized egg is referred to as a zygote. It's the union or the pairing of the two sex cells. And then this last example I liked because it kind of brings our whole vocabulary full circle. Our very first term back in August, right? Unbelievable, uh, was A. And A was a negating term, I mean the opposite of. So something that's A zygous is something that is not paired. So name for me an A zygous organ. A zygous. Heart, where there's only one of them, there's not a pair, right? Liver, heart, spleen, kid, uh, uh, liver, gallbladder. There's a lot of azygous organs, right? We have some that are paired, uh, like the two lungs, the two kidneys. But for the most part, most of our organs are azygous. How about an azygous blood vessel? Yeah, you only have one aorta, but you do have two femoral arteries, two femoral veins, right? So many of your arteries and veins are also paired, but we have some azygous uh, arteries and veins. We have some azygous bones, right? We talked about those way back in skeletal system, like the bomer or the ethmoid or the sphenoid. There's only one. They're not paired. Okay, so that's the vocab. We'll finish up next Tuesday, and I'll introduce these pharmacological abbreviations. Some of them are kind of old school. Some of them are being used routinely. You'll still see them um, in medical records. You'll still see them. Uh, an old time doctor will still write these on the pharmacy pad. And it's sort of written in code to the pharmacist and tells them what to write on the pad. So we'll go over this next time. And that'll finish up the vocabulary. So it's a little bit of a twist, a difference in the vocabulary approach from what we've been doing typically. But I'll, I'll prep you for that next time. So urea on to the end. For this, if you want to go up and make your note cards for the weekend, you could just do the same thing. Um, ATC just means around the clock. It means something at regular intervals. So if you want to make up note cards and you just get it over with, you could do the same thing with these terms and just put uh, BID meaning twice a day, right? Or C or CAP meaning a capsule. So some of these are pretty straightforward. But if you wanted to, there's three or four of these slides. You could make up note cards just like you've been doing for the vocabulary terms. One side has the term on the right, or the word on the right, and the other side has the abbreviation on the left. OK, so that is vocabulary for the final. And it's not morning, it's afternoon, but let's take a look at the respiratory system. Again, uh, well, let me, let me back up. The exam, a little bit disappointing. Now, I, I don't mean to be horrible or harsh on you, but we had done two labs on the cardiovascular system. We had seen the heart, we had seen blood, we'd seen vessels, we'd been introduced to it uh, over a couple of weeks. We were kind of immersed in it in the lab. So I expected the exam to go better than it did. I really did. Um, the average was okay, but it wasn't as strong as it should have been. And there were some nice scores, but there were some really low scores. And I, I have a hard time getting into people's heads. The people who made the low scores, honestly, could, people, could be people who have already decided that they're not going to finish this semester, they're going to repeat the course, and maybe they just came in to see what the exam was going to be about and really didn't put much effort into it, and therefore the average was lower than it should have been. I hope that nobody earnestly studied for this exam and gets a 30 or a 40, right? But there were 19 people who flat out failed the exam. That's a lot of people at this point in the semester on content that I thought was pretty, not easy, right? But we talked about it in a different, couple different ways in lab and in lecture. So I was surprised by the low average. But if I take away some of the lowest scores, then the average does rise to something more reasonable and within the, the, the realm of normal. So again, go by and look at the exam. They'll be there when you get back. 
there is something to be learned from looking at the exam. Um, I've had one person look at the exam. There might be a couple of issues on there. I may be owing some of you some points. I'll find out here tonight and tomorrow, and I'll make those adjustments if necessary. Okay, but it won't be a huge adjustment, but there might be an adjustment of a point or two. We'll see. Maybe my key was wrong. Um, so um, this next exam is also going to be over content that you have seen now or will see over two labs. Last week was urinary and respiratory, and this week is, is, is reproductive. So again, my hope is that as I go through this, you're saying, okay, I've seen these structures. I, I know where the larynx is. I know the bronchioles. I've heard all this. Let me put it all together now as I hear about this a second time. So that's the hope. Some of these slides, now I know that in lecture, or sorry, in lab, you did not get a full respiratory presentation. We watched that video instead. And that was just a different way of learning and hearing about this content. So let me go through this. Uh, some of this will be first time. Some of this should look really familiar based upon the images that you've already labeled in the lab. So the first thing is kind of getting your handle on the respiratory system. And we can divide it up in a couple of different ways. One way is anatomical. And the anatomical breakdown basically says we have an upper respiratory and a lower respiratory tract. And I'll show that picture to you in a moment. Um, the lower respiratory tract, if you want to put a note right next to it, starts with the larynx. So LL, the lower respiratory starts with the larynx and goes inferior. The other way of dividing up the respiratory system is to think about its physiology. What's going on? It's functional. Di uh, differentiation. And here we'll talk about a conducting zone and a respiratory zone. The conducting zone is basically the straw. It's, it's the way by which air gets down to the microscopic structures of your lung. That's going to include your nasal passages, your pharynx, your larynx, your trachea, all the way down the bronchi and the bronchioles. Then, once that air gets down into the microscopic structures of your lung, then there's gas exchange going on. And the gas exchange happens in what's referred to as the respiratory portion of the respiratory system. And as we'll see more clearly, it's going to include those little air sacs, the alveoli. So here is a picture just showing the upper and lower. And again, just kind of draw a line. Kind of the epiglottis is kind of the borderline here. And everything from the larynx down is lower respiratory tract. Okay, and I'll have some wordage coming up to clarify that for you. Again, that is an anatomical classification. So what are, the, what, are, what are the lungs doing? What's the respiratory system doing for your overall well-being? Well, number one, it is breathing, if you will. Another way of saying that is ventilation, right? You're ventilating. Um, it's a cycle. We can get that. We breathe in, we breathe out. We inhale. Another way of saying that is we inspire, and we use this word in many different ways, right? If we're inspired by something, then we're kind of turned on by it, we're, we're excited by it. And then we exhale, we get rid of air, or we expire. Well, expire is used to describe the date of your milk that spoils, and also the time of death, right? They've expired. So we use these words in very different ways. Clearly, though, if you're inspired, you're alive, and if you're expired, you're dead. So breathing must be pretty important to life. Uh, so inhalation, exhalation, we get that. Also, though, as the air is being drawn into your lungs, it is humidified and warmed. Most of the time, we walk around in a place where the temperature of the air is cooler than our body temperature, right? Now, if you're living in Houston in the summer, then clearly the air is, more, is warmer, right? Or if in Arizona then the air can be warmer. But most of the time in Michigan, for certainly, we're walking around with air temperature cooler than our 98.7 body temperature. And um, as the air goes down to your air sacs, it will be, by the time it gets there, it will be body temperature. So even if it's minus 20 outside, by the time the air gets down to your alveoli, that air will be at body temperature. And it's a very important thing that I didn't make a slide up about or not, but what happens to your tires in the wintertime? They get a little flat, don't they? They need some air. And what happens on a hot day? The pressure goes up, right? So we know that temperature can affect pressure, 
okay? And we're not going to get into the, 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 the gas laws that go through that in chemistry. But we know, right, that if you put a, a balloon, if you could put a balloon in the freezer, right, it'll kind of shrink. And you put a balloon in the oven, if you could, it would warm up. And same reason why if you take a helium balloon, you buy it at Meyer, and you're like, oh, I'm going to bring this to the hospital, and it's a cold day, and you go outside, and it kind of gets kind of limp. But as soon as you go back into the warm hospital, right, it kind of reinflates. The same idea. If the air going down into our little air sacs was vastly warmer or cooler than the body, then the little alveoli would be like that balloon. It would be expanding and shrinking, and that's not something you want to have happen. So by the time the air gets down to the alveoli, it will be essentially room temperature or body temperature. Now, when you first walk outside and it's minus 20, that first gasp of air, right, you may feel like your lungs constrict or it's really hot to, uh, hard to breathe in a sauna at first and then your body adjusts. So there is the first couple of breaths in a vastly different environment can affect the airflow through your pulmonary system, but usually our body adjusts rather quickly. So we've got the warming and the humidifying and cleaning of the air. Because as the air comes in, it's going through the cilia that are along your trachea. Um, it is being picked up by the mucus. Remember, you got mucus going down. If you look at your pluck on Tuesday or, uh, or tonight or last Thursday, you may recall that the pluck along the trachea, there was like this pink foam. That's sort of the mucus that stuff that's lining the trachea. Anybody see the pink foam? It kind of looks like the pink foam at the car wash. When you pay the extra dollar, you get the pink foam on your car. It's that same consistency. Um, but it's basically the mucus that you'll see lining the trachea and the airways when you look at your pluck. Uh, the sound production, uh, as the vocal cords, air goes by them, the vocal cords vibrate, and that produces sound. Olfaction, we certainly have within our nose the olfactory nerve and the little hairs that are the receptors for smell. And then also I mentioned that mucus that's helping to catch foreign particles, and that's certainly helping uh, your immune system. Don't forget, too, that within your nasopharynx, there are the pharyngeal tonsils, right? Your adenoids are back there. That's part of your immune system. And your uh, palatine tonsils in the oropharynx. So the upper respiratory tract, pretty straightforward. We know this. This is the nose. Uh, even your sinuses are part of this. Uh, the throat, the pharynx, this is all conducting zone. There's no gas exchange happening anywhere in the upper respiratory tract. Now, you've seen a model that looks a lot like this sagittal section of the head. And this, I would hope, is very, very comfortable for you. So let me do the idea of green dots, and you tell me what the green dot is on. Frontal sinus. Frontal sinus. Sphenoid or sphenoidal sinus. There are two sinuses we cannot see, ethmoidal and maxillary. I'll show you a picture of those in a moment. Um, these little shelf-like structures. Inferior, middle, and superior, concha. concha, right? Concha or concha. These are the, like the shelf-like structures. Now, going between those shelf-like structures are tube-like passageways where the air actually flows. Each of those is called a meatus. We saw that term before external auditory meatus, the tube-like passageway for the ear canal. What is directly behind that is the pharyngeal tonsils, right, the adenoids. It's straight back behind your nasal passages. And don't forget that you also have the opening right there for the auditory tube, the eustachian tube that goes to your middle ear. That's all up in your nasal pharynx, isn't it? It's all up in the upper portion. Um, then, hard palate. What bones are making up the hard palate? Maxilla. Yeah, the maxilla, right? The maxilla, upper jaw. And can you remember when you flipped over the skull? There was the maxilla, and then there was a pair of bones that went a little further back. The name makes sense now. They were the palatine bones right, the palate, the palatine bones. So they're the bones that make up the hard palate. And then there's this soft, flappy part, right? And the end of that we call the uvula. Also back here, that's sitting right on top of the regular 
uh, Palatine tonsil way back there. This is the epiglottis. And let's go down. Right in this area, there's two folds. The upper fold is the false vocal fold, also called the vestibular fold. And the lower one is the true vocal cord or your true vocal ligament. And we'll go through that again in other pictures. Is there anything at all in this image that is giving you trouble or needs to be clarified? You're definitely going to say this model, this represented model on the lab practical, and you certainly need to know these structures on the exam for the final. We see that word vestibule, right, that ge generic word that means entryway into, so that's referring to a nasal vestibule. Other books might refer to this as an oral vestibule, the opening into the mouth. There's a vaginal vestibule. We saw the vestibule going into the ear, right, the, into the inner ear. So the vestibule is just a term. And then we see that vestibular fold, right, in the entryway to the larynx. So you see this term all over the body. So we saw in that picture two of these sinuses. We were able to see the frontal and the sphenoidal. But there are two other sinuses. Um, they're air-filled spaces, normally. If you have an infection, that air-filled space gets filled with bacterial gunk. And the other two that you cannot see on our model are going to be shown here. And you can see the ethmoidal sinuses and the larger maxillary sinus. Now, they're too lateral to see in our model. So we only see them in this representation in this way. They all are connected by ducts one to another. An infection in one can spread to other sinuses. And look at the drainage. Take this off. Look at the drainage for the maxillary sinus. If you want your maxillary sinuses to drain, you better stand on your head. right? So the day after you've been taking some antibiotics, if you have a sinus infection and you've got that really heavy infection in your maxillary sinuses, you're going to want to be kind of you know, getting in an anti-gravity chair, sitting upside down or something, and letting those maxillary sinuses drain because literally they have to drain up. right? And then they're all going to drain into your nasal passages. These sinuses are also lined by the same epithelium that we expect in the respiratory system, and that is what? Whenever I say respiratory system, you should be thinking pseudostratified columnar with cilia. And that's the kind of epithelium that will be lining your nasal passages, lining your sinuses, and lining your trachea. So we're going to go through this just as carefully and as, as thoroughly as we can. So the pharynx, uh, the anatomical throat, is a organ that is shared by both the respiratory and the digestive systems. Of course, it passes air and food. If you think about it, it's kind of a funnel-shaped structure. So if you open up big, you know, the mouth, and then it kind of comes to a funnel shape as it goes down into the oro and, and the laryngopharynx. And you've seen all three parts of the pharynx. You know there's a portion way up in the nasal passages, right behind the oral cavity, and then also down by the larynx. So we can divide it up into these three regions that we've seen. Now, wherever the pharynx is going to see air only, you're going to have pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Wherever in the pharynx there is typically food, what kind of epithelium would you see? In order to protect my body from a Dorito, when I eat it, my oral cavity and down my esophagus, I better have stratified squamous non-keratinized. Remember, keratin is only found on the skin. So the non-keratinized layers, right, stratified squamous, non-keratinized. I'll say this again in a moment, but as we think about the three parts of the pharynx, and you've seen this before, so we know this, right? Nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx. And I'm going to go through a slide for each of these areas and kind of highlight where one starts, where one stops. But while I'm here in this simplistic picture, let me remind you, I'm going to 
change colors here, I guess, and go to something kind of red, I guess. Oh, that's not red, is it? How about that? So the sinuses and the nasal sinuses and all of the nasal pharynx, what sort of epithelium? What's normally there? Air only. You don't need a stratified epithelium to protect you from air. So there you only have a pseudo-stratified. Remember, pseudo-stratified really is a simple epithelium. It's only one layer thick. It looks jumbled and multiple layer, but it's really pseudo-stratified. It's really a simple epithelium. This is why in the wintertime, right, you go to touch the inside of your nose, and it can bleed very, very easily. You know, our air passages get dry in this dry weather, and it doesn't take much to break through that, and you can bleed, you know, very easily uh, because you only have a one layer thick cell layer, right, between you and the blood, bl blood below. Now, if your food, all right, let's change it to vegetables, green, okay. So going through the oral cavity, what are you going to have epithelium-wise? Stratified, squamous, non-keratinized, I keep saying it. What about the oropharynx? Same thing, right? Food and laryngopharynx and all the way down the esophagus. Same old thing, right? This is what's cool. So all of this up here in red, right, all of this was pseudostratified, and so is the trachea. So there's this really cool change. I mean, it, if you could look under the microscope right at the border of the nasopharynx and the oropharynx, you would see this abrupt change in the epithelium. You would see it switch from pseudostratified to stratified squamous non-keratinized. And then if you could follow it down into the trachea, you would see it abruptly change back. It's really a cool thing. Okay, so I just want to make sure that this whole epithelia thing is making sense to you. Is that clarified? Wherever food would go, normally, stratified squamous. Wherever air would typically only be found, pseudostratified columnar. So let's go through these three regions. The nasopharynx, you know, is the superior most region of the pharynx. It is directly behind your nasal cavities. It is above your soft palate. Picture all this together. When you go back to the picture of all this, look at these words and literally draw yourself a little line, right? Look at my, my little GPS here. I'm saying the nasopharynx is behind the nasal passages, above the soft palate, right? And usually, again, only air passes through this area. Now, in the nasal pharynx, you also see that opening for the auditory tube, a.k.a. the eustachian tube. So we saw that right there. And right next to that opening for the pharyngeal, sorry, the opening for the um, eustachian tube, right there are the adenoids. They're right there in close proximity. So kids who have inner ear, middle ear infections, also usually have adenoid issues, right? The tonsils and adenoids and, and middle ear infections all sort of go together, and you're visiting the ENT, the ear, nose, and throat doctor, because they all kind of go together. Infections of the ear piss off the adenoids, and they get inflamed, and it's just this big uh, cycle. Go, now we go down to the oropharynx. This is the middle part of your pharynx. It is directly behind your oral cavity. It is bordered on the top by the soft palate, and below by the hyoid bone. Think about the larynx on a stick model. Can you picture it up in the lab? The larynx on the stick model, the very top of that was the hyoid bone, right? So the hyoid bone is the border, if you will, between the oropharynx above and the laryngopharynx below. The oropharynx is definitely going to be surrounded by or coated by stratified squamous not keratinized because food is definitely going through this area. If you open your mouth really big, you would see some arches, if you will, of muscles. We're not going to name those muscles, uh, the palatopharyngeal arches, if you will. But you can imagine that this is distensible. This is stretchy because food is going to enter into these areas and be pushed back by the tongue down toward the pharynx. And again, we have the lymphatic organs, the tonsils sitting there, in the oropharynx. Finally is the laryngopharynx. This is the most inferior area. It's the most narrow. 
it is everything below the hyoid and goes down to pretty much the epiglottis, where the track switch is for the trachea and for the esophagus. In the, and it leads down to the larynx, to the voice box. Again, by the time we get to this, we're back to stratified squamous non-keratinized because in the laryngopharynx, um, we're still having food down in this area. This is still a food and area place. This is the table that just tells you what I've just told you. Nasal pharynx, pseudostratified. Oro and laryngopharynx both have your stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. And then over here are the borders. I've already got that in the slide. So just to, again, I like tables. I like looking at everything in one place. I know these are small, but if you look at them on your computer, you might find these useful. Okay, so that was upper respiratory tract, right? I've kind of been going through everything in the upper respiratory tract. Now let me go to the larynx and below and, ed and enter into the lower respiratory tract. Now the lower respiratory tract still can has a lot of the conducting airway. By this, when I say conducting, it just simply means that it's air is flowing through, right? It's going through this. And this is going to include the larynx, the trachea, down all the way through the bronchi. Eventually, though, we're going to get down to the respiratory portion. And I'll say this now, and I'll show you a picture in a few moments. The respiratory portion includes what's called the respiratory bronchioles. Well, that's easy. The respiratory bronchioles are in the respiratory portion. The alveola, or the alveolar ducts, and finally the alveoli. So bear with me, and I'll show you a picture of that when we get to the end. So the larynx, you know it as your voice box. <clears throat> and um, the larynx is really the last chance for you to cough up something. So if you swallow something inappropriately, and it's going down the wrong tube, right, and rather than going down the esophagus, it makes its way into the larynx. In the larynx, you're going to find the vocal folds. There's the true vocal cords, and then right above it, the vestibular folds. That's your last chance, right, to hack that stuff up. So if you don't push air up and out or cough it up at that point, if it gets below that and gets down into your trachea, it's not as likely that you're going to get that stuff coughed up. It's possible, but it's more difficult. Once it gets past the voice box, it's going to kerplunk down into the lungs more likely. So we know that the larynx is still a conducting area, and that sound is produced here. There are nine pieces of cartilage that make up your larynx. We're only concerned about two. So yes, there are other pieces of cartilage. If when you are cutting into your pluck, or if you're doing that tonight, the anatomy of the pig is the same as us. There's still a big chunk of, of, of uh, tracheal cartilage, and then there, or sorry, of the um, thyroid cartilage, and then the cricoid cartilage, and then there'll be the other pieces of cartilage as well. So it's kind of a crunchy area, but it definitely protects our voice box very, very well. So the only two that you worry about are the um, thyroid and cricoid cartilage. Okay, so you're going to see some other things labeled in this diagram that you're just going to ignore. So all you need to worry about here, again, if you're looking at this, this looks like the larynx on a stick model. There's the epiglottis. Here's the hyoid bone. So we're definitely down in the larynx. <clears throat> and the big chunk of cartilage is the thyroid cartilage. And the second chunk of cartilage here is the cricoid cartilage. Other than that, there's not a whole lot you need to worry about here. And then there's a variable number of C-rings, depending on how tall you are. If you have a longer trachea, you'd have a few more of these C-rings along the way. From the side, <clears throat> I want you to notice, just kind of focus in right here on the mid-sagittal cut. And in purple, I know you don't have color, but there's, a, there's two ligaments going across right there. The top one, that's that false vocal cord or the vestibular fold. The lower one is the true vocal cord, um, marked here, the true vocal ligament or the true vocal cord. So to sing, to speak, means that your two vocal ligaments are going to come side by side. And as air is being passed up through your trachea, it's going to vibrate those ligaments, much like guitar strings or piano strings. And if you've ever looked at a guitar, you know, six or 12 string or four string bass, whatever, or looked at a piano, right, you know that the thin strings are going to be the higher pitched, 
and the thicker strings are going to be the lower pitch. Women typically have thinner vocal cords. That gives them a higher pitch voice. Guys, testosterone helps to thicken and develop that vocal cord a little bit thicker. It's going to get deeper in sound as a result. And this is why, historically, uh, they would castrate little boys, because by castrating, removing the testes, no testosterone, and the vocal cords would stay nice and skinny, and they could sing alto or soprano the rest of their life, right, in the church choirs and things. So there were people who would actually volunteer to be castrated so they could stay soprano. Um, I always tell the story my, in Alabama when we lived there, there was a very, very fine, very competitive children's choir. And there was a boys' choir and a girls' choir. And the moment those boys started changing their voice, they were kicked out. Whoop, you're out. You can't sing soprano anymore. And there was very little use for a boy that could sing low. So that boys' choir, the parents were sitting there saying, next year our kids go to England. Next year our kids go to Italy. They went internationally. They were a very, very, very high group. But if their voice changed, they were out. So they're like making plans to send their kid next year to Italy for this choir tour. Oh, their voice changed. I guess we get a refund. So, you know, again, the testosterone of puberty starts to thicken that cord, and boys kind of go through that awkward moment where their voice kind of fluctuates up and down as that process is occurring. So, again, in the, in the larynx, we have the two sets of ligaments. The more superior are the vestibular, the false vocal cords. Down below, we have the true vocal cords. It's really an unfortunate name since the false vocal cords have nothing to do with sound production at all. They probably shouldn't call them vocal cords. But we're stuck with it. If you could take away all the muscle and the epithelial layers of the larynx, it would look much like this. All you're looking at here is the cartilage and the vocal ligaments. Kind of looks like a big jaw of a big shark jaw to me, right, at the Smithsonian or a natural museum. But the big chunk, the big piece of cartilage in the back, that's what we know. That's the big thyroid cartilage. The one internal is the cricoid cartilage. Don't worry about anything else, right? The two pieces we know, the big one and the little one. Then the two vocal ligaments are the purple strings in the middle. On the right-hand side, they're separated, and the person would be breathing. The cords are not touching each other. They're not going to be vibrating. They're not producing sound. If on the left-hand side, when they come inward, now they're going to vibrate against each other. At this point, the person can't breathe. Right? You can't breathe in while speaking. There's a one-way air going up, forming the vibration sound. Now, here... Imagine now we put the muscle and all the epithelial tissues back in place. So this is the epiglottis, right? There's the epiglottis just to get our bearings. And here's a little bit of the tongue. And these would be the true vocal cords, right? They're covered now by the epithelia. The curtain, right, this curtain area, is truly the, the false vocal cord. So the false vocal cord, the vestibular folds, are shown here pretty much as the curtain, right? So the curtain's opening, the person's breathing. As the curtain closes, those vocal ligaments are touching each other, they're in close proximity, and they're vibrating. The other things on here don't worry about at all. Okay, moving down below the larynx, we're now in the trachea. This is a flexible pipe. You will see that in the pluck. You can, you know, play with that trachea. It's very, very flexible. You'll be able to see and appreciate those C-rings. Um, the trachea is passing through the mediastinum. That is the area between your lungs up in the thoracic cavity. And the trachea is going to go from the larynx all the way down to the carina. The carina is where the trachea is going to split into the right and left primary bronchi. Along the way, there'll be 15 or 20 or so C-shaped rings of cartilage. Uh, this is hyaline cartilage. This is the same kind of cartilage that your bones once were before they became ossified. This is the same kind of cartilage that helps to make up um, some of your rib structures as well. And um, again, those C-rings are going to keep the trachea wide open. This is why if someone's having an allergic response, and their tongue is swelling, right? What are we going to do? We're going to take a big pen in an emergency and poke a hole in their trachea, right? And we're going to bypass 
the blockage, but we're going to save their life but because that trachea has been kept open. Question? What kind of cartilage did you Hyaline. Okay. Hyaline. So it's just good old Hyaline cartilage. So um, I'll show you a picture of this in a moment. In fact, here's the picture. Huh? That was a quick moment. So we got the trachea in a model cartoon on the, on the left-hand side. So there's the larynx that we know and love. Here's the trachea. Comes down and splits at the carina. I don't know if I told you this, but I have a sister-in-law whose name is Karina, and she kind of has a split personality. So it's easy for me to remember this, right? Carina, Karina, split, works. Um, heart's kind of sitting right here, isn't it? A little bit off to the left. So we've got a left lung and a right lung. Now, what do we know about the left lung? How many lobes? Only two, right? It's smaller. It has to make room for the heart. So there's a primary bronchus and then the secondary bronchi, right? And there are only two lobes, so there are only two secondary bronchi. On the right-hand side, there are three lobes. So here's your primary bronchus, one, two, three, secondary bronchi. There are as many secondary bronchi as there are lobes. Now, if you were going to aspirate food and something got down the wrong pipe and it's now got past your vocal cords and it's coming right down your trachea, where is it likely going to end up, right or left side? The right side. If you look at it, the right side is bigger in diameter because more air does go to the right lung than to the left lung. There are three lobes, there's more surface area, there's more gas exchange occurring in the right lung than in the left. And so while we do have two lungs, they're not the same, right? They're not, they're not mirror images of each other. Also, if you look at it, the right primary bronchus is more of a straightward pathway down, whereas the left does take this horizontal shift to accommodate the heart. So again, if something's gonna come down the, the trachea, it's more than likely gonna kerplunk on the right side go straight down the bigger hole that's straight down rather than the smaller bronchus that goes over to the side. Histologically, if you were to take a look at the trachea, that's what's shown here, big open airspace, right? In this particular view, the hyaline cartilage was stained yellow. So the yellow that you're seeing there is the C-ring. So if you see a big gaping open space with cartilage around the outside, and what does cartilage look like under the microscope? Little eyeballs looking back at you, right? Little cat eyes, car little fish eyes looking back at you. So if you see cartilage and a big open airway, you've gotta be looking at the trachea. And what kind of epithelium would be lining that airway? Pseudostratified. We're back to the same story I've already gone through with you. Oh, and what's right behind? What's right behind the trachea? There's the esophagus, right, right behind it. When you did the pluck or when you do the pluck tonight, you're going to see that the esophagus is running right behind the trachea. Okay, so what else about the trachea that I haven't mentioned? So the trachea goes down as far as the right and left primary bronchi. And then we're going to see each of those primary bronchi go off to the side laterally and enter into the lungs. Um, they're going to split again at the carina. So we pretty much was putting into words what we've already seen in the pictures. Now, once you take that turn and you enter into the lung, the bronchi are going to continue to branch, progressively smaller and smaller and smaller. And there are, I've heard different numbers, but 20-some levels of branching. If you cut into the lungs tonight in the pluck, you will see that you'll see larger and then you'll see very microscopic or smaller uh, airway tubes, right? And, and are they secondary, tertiary, fifth level, eighth level, tenth level? Who knows? But all these different smaller and smaller, progressively smaller airways. Now, eventually, as you go through this tree, and the reason it's called a bronchial tree, imagine now that everything's turned upside down. The trachea becomes the trunk of the tree. And then this tree has two branches and then they branch off into the, into the tree, right? So it kind of would look like a tree if you turn the whole trachea and bronchial structures upside down. Eventually, those bronchi will turn into very small terminal bronchioles. When you see the ending, ole, 
you know that OLE means small. Let me clarify a couple things that happened on the quiz last week, or maybe will happen tonight. The trachea comes down and splits into the primary bronchi, not bronchioles. The bronchioles are going to be almost microscopic. So the bronchi are the big, bronchus, bronchi, big, right? Um, and then bronchioles are going to be very, very small. Eventually, the smallest of these branches are called the terminal bronchioles. Well, that makes sense. We're at the end, right? Terminal at the end. As you move through the bronchial tree, there'll be less and less cartilage. The trachea has cartilage. The primary bronchi, the secondary bronchi, you see cartilage. If you're cutting through them with your scalpel in the lab, crunchy. But the smaller bronchioles don't have any cartilage. They just have smooth muscle around them. So they cut differently. They're not crunchy. They're just kind of a, you know, they're, they're still elastic. We've already talked about the shape and the orientation of the right and left bronchi. And so if you did have that foreign object coming down the trachea, it would normally end up on the right side. Now, we would say that the primary bronchi enter into the hilum of the, of the lungs. We saw that word hilum in the lab for the kidney, didn't we? And what's the hilum? It's a general term that means passageway, everything that goes into and out of, right? So in the kidney, right, the hilum was where the renal artery, the renal vein, the ureter, and other things would go into and out of the kidney. In the lungs, it's the same idea. You'll see in a picture in a moment that the pulmonary artery, the pulmonary veins, the primary bronchus, all of that is going in and out of the, of the lungs in a very small localized area called the hilum. Now, here's a word that you'll appreciate. The secondary bronchi are also called the lobar bronchi, right? Remember, the, no, the number of secondary bronchi equals the number of lobes. And so they're called the lobar or the secondary <coughs> bronchi. The right side has three lobes, therefore three secondary or lobar bronchi. And it keeps branching, right? But you can't keep track of that. Eventually, um, there are different numbers. Don't worry about these numbers. Don't memorize these 8 to 10 numbers. I'm not going to worry about that. Um, but eventually you get down into these segments. If a person's going to have a portion of their lung removed, it is possible to take out one of these segments, one of these bronchopulmonary segments. So a person has a, a lung cancer or something else, lung disease, if they're able to, they'll take out a segment of the lung. Well, because each segment gets, has its own airway, Right? It's possible to take off a segment of the lung and kind of block off that airway, and the rest of the lung can still function independent of that missing portion. So the lung can be sort of chunked off, and you still have very good functional regions in the other parts of the lung. Here's just a simplified picture of the lung. Again, you can see the primary bronchi. Let me put some color on this. This is where the heart would be, so we would call that the cardiac notch. Only two lobes, upper and lower, or that's, that's wrong, uh, what do we call that? Superior, right? And inferior or upper and lower lobes. And if you look, there's one secondary bronchus and another secondary bronchus, and that one's going down to the lower side. Over here on the right side, one, two, three secondary bronchi going to each of the three lobes. So there's an upper, a middle, and a lower lobe on the right side. There's an issue with this upper picture. I don't think this picture is currently in your textbook, but this upper picture has a problem. Can you see that well enough? They're calling the blue secondary bronchi. Do you agree the heart's here? So what have they done? What did the artist screw up on here? Yeah, it, they clearly showed one, two, three secondary bronchi on the left and only two on the right. So they just messed up. The artist didn't take my class. Okay. Now, this looks very, very similar, if not identical to the picture you have in your Amerman book, also similar in your, in your Martini book. This is the page, I think it's page 518. It's right before your model inventory list for the respiratory system. We are down in the microscopic structures. You would not be able to really see this. We don't have a model that represents this in the lab. Remember, we're in the lung. We're in the pulmonary circulation. So everything color-wise is turned around. 
I'm going to draw a line right here. Everything above this line is conducting zone. Everything below this line is respiratory zone. If you look back in my description of the conducting zone, I told you that it ended at terminal bronchioles. So there it is. The terminal bronchiole is the at the end, right, of the conducting zone. So I've got an arrow going into a terminal bronchus, bronchiole, sorry. It's just a very minuscule little airway. Below that point, it labels this as a respiratory bronchiole. So here's the respiratory bronchiole, and notice that even coming off the respiratory bronchiole, there are little alveoli sort of bulging off the side. Now, those little alveoli are where the gas exchange is occurring. So because there's these bulging alveoli coming off from the bronchiole, it's called a respiratory bronchiole, and there is gas exchange happening there. Then if you look back, I also said that the respiratory zone includes an alveolar duct, so a duct bringing that air down into the air sacs. So that's shown here. And then these millions and millions of little microscopic air sacs, each of which is an alveolus, alveoli plural. Now, isn't it cute that each of those little alveoli has its own capillary bed? All right, this is how intricate this is. So every one of those little microscopic air sacs has its own dedicated little capillary bed around it. Now, what's happening at this capillary bed? Gas exchange, right? So gas is coming in the lungs, going all the way down to these little air sacs, and then that oxygen is going to be picked up by the blood at the capillaries. But remember that this is the pulmonary circuit. So blood is coming into the lung from the right side of the heart, through blue pulmonary arteries, eventually little pulmonary arterioles, and then down into the little capillary bed. Now note that the capillaries in this drawing are going from blue blood to red blood. Right? At this point, we're bringing blue blood in, and we're picking up oxygen. We're reoxygenating the blood, so it's becoming red. Then that blood is leaving the lungs through a series of pulmonary veins, that we know is now going back to the left heart. That all makes sense, color-wise, orientation-wise. Maybe. Maybe it makes sense. What is, what is the bottom? There's conducting zone? Yeah, so again, Right, this line, everything above it is conducting zone, which means there's no gas exchange happening. This is all just the straw bringing air down. Then below this line, we're in the respiratory zone where gas exchange is happening. Does that make sense now? And then this is simplified, but you're going to have millions of these alveoli, hundreds of millions. We'll talk more about that in a second. So if you were to look at a chunk of lung under the microscope, this is what you're going to see. It looks like a very fine, delicate lace. Each of these little circular areas would be an alveolus, right? And you're just kind of randomly cutting through the lung. That delicate lace is composed of simple squamous epithelium, right? The thinnest, one layer thick, flat cells. Over on the right is a scanning electron micrograph. So now we get to see things, but we see the, the, the dimensionality, the thickness of it. So on the top, up through here, this would be a terminal bronchi bronchial. There's nothing going on. That's still conducting zone. And then you see it come down, and they're now calling it a respiratory bronchial because bulging off from this, we see some alveoli. And then eventually going down to all these little air sacs. So these, it looks like a sponge, doesn't it? All these little air sacs, all these little alveoli, and there has to be air going down to all those. So if you cut into the lung in your pluck, you're going to see this vast array of little tubes all over the place bringing air down to the microscopic air sacs. Now, what's going on in this area? 
in the alveoli, each of these alveoli is only about a quarter to half of a millimeter in diameter. Can you see that with your naked eye? Yeah, you could. I mean, if you look at the lung upstairs when you're doing the pluck and you're cutting the finest little pory looking things you see would be alveoli. Very, very small. Your fingernail is about a millimeter thick. So now take a quarter of that or half of that and make a little ball, right? That'd be the little area of an alveolus. The alveolus is all about bringing air in and for gas exchange happening. And remember that gas exchange happens via diffusion. Remember lab two, diffusion. Molecules going from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. No energy, no ATP, just the movement of molecules. And this gas exchange is going to happen in about 300 to 400 million alveoli. It's amazing how many of these little air sacs there are in your two lungs. If you could take each of those little alveoli and spread it out and lay it flat on the ground, I've been told it would create the surface area of a tennis court. So you could be take all those 300 million alveoli, lay, you know, lay, un, unwrap them, lay them flat, it would be this huge area, right? That huge area all coated with capillaries. And all of that surface area is what's necessary for the gases to be readily diffused into our tissues. And this is just in the lungs. That same thing happens in the tissues, doesn't it? when we drop off the oxygen. So it's just as amazing at the tissues as well. So let's take a look. We're zooming all the way in. We are zooming all the way in here. This is a cutaway of an alveolus. Imagine it's enclosed all the way around. Air had to get in there somehow. So there's the alveolar duct that brought air into this little space. The cells lining this, each of them is a simple squamous epithelium, right? So you're making this little flat layer of cells. Remember, around every one of these alveoli had a little capillary bed around it. So here's a capillary, right? Here's a capillary, here's a capillary. So you see capillaries as often as possible. Inside the capillary, it's even showing you a red blood cell. Again, just to remind you that red blood cells are not that much smaller than the entire capillary. There's a couple of other cells down here. There are macrophages. Macrophages are like little Pac-Man cells, right? They're chewing up things that shouldn't be there. So should a bacterium or should a dust particle or a, some, a pollen molecule or maybe your neighbor's skin cells, right, that are sloughing off right now and you're breathing in. If one of those cells or one of those things gets all the way past your trachea, gets all the way past the cilia and the mucus of your trachea, gets all the way down <laughs> through the multiple layers of bronchi and bronchioles, and still makes it all the way down to your little alveoli, you still have macrophages waiting to gobble those things up. So it's another part of our immune system, right? We have these specialized macrophages there to gobble up pollen or things that would get there. There are also, down here, uh, the type 1 cells. It's just labeled. The type 1 cells are your normal cells. They're the cells that are making up, you know, the wall of your alveolus. And then there are also some type 2 cells. And I'm just going to say this. Um, you may have heard of it. I'm not going to study it too much this semester. But the type 2 cells make surfactant. Surfactant is basically detergent. It's made by these cells down in the little alveoli. And the reason is this. If there wasn't a soapy film on these alveoli, then they would tend to collapse. And this soap bubble creates a little bit of a surface tension and allows the gases to move more easily and, and keeps the little air sacs from collapsing. I'll talk a lot more about that next semester, but if you've heard about surfactant, this is why preemies are born and need respiratory support. Surfactant usually is not made by a fetal lung until, I want to say, the 29th or so week, 28 weeks. So a baby born early, prematurely, its lungs 
I've not yet started making this detergent surfactant. And as a result, those kids are going to have respiratory issues when they're born. And so what they try to do is keep the baby in the incubator as long as possible, right? Slow down childbirth. But they also may give the mother and ultimately the baby a shot of steroids. And those steroids are also help, they're supposed to help sort of kick up this production of surfactant. So perhaps the baby's lungs will be a little bit more independent once he or she is born. More about that next semester. Now, we're really zooming in now. I like the sound effect, right? We're really zooming in. So we're now all the way in. Here's the alveolus, right? Here's the air sac. It's only one layer thick, right? Simple squamous. Here's a red blood cell. We know red blood cells carry that lovely molecule hemoglobin, and they're going to be carrying the oxygen. So when we talk about gas exchange, what are we really talking about? Air, O2, has to get out of the air sac, go through the one layer, right, go through one layer of the alveolus, and then go through one more layer of the capillary before it can get to the red blood cell and then be carried, right? Oxygen's carried by the hemoglobin on the red blood cells. Likewise, CO2 has to do the opposite, right? CO2 has to leave the blood and come back out, and then it's blown off as we expire. Collectively, this is called the respiratory membrane. Now, I can still hear that woman saying that word in that video you heard in lab, right? I've heard that just a few hundred times, right? But that video you watched with the cadaver and the description of the um, respiratory system, I can still hear her saying, the respiratory membrane, right? So, but it's really referring to this double membrane. It's a double layer of simple squamous epithelium. It's kind of fused together. And this has to stay really, really thin. Again, we'll talk more about diseases and conditions that make that more difficult next semester. Okay, any questions about the air, the alveoli, the movement of air over to the capillaries? Anything else in there? That makes sense to you? Uh, this table, again, the structures of the lower respiratory tract, larynx, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, it doesn't say in here the word, well, it does, terminal bronchioles. That's the end, right, of the conducting zone. Then below this line, it'd be the respiratory zone, but the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and the alveoli. Just a couple more things about the anatomy of the lungs. They're conical in shape. We said the heart's conical, right? It's got the, the apex, the cone-like ending of it. The, the lungs have the same thing. Um, they have a base that's also familiar, right, with the heart. And the base is sitting right on top of the diaphragm. The top, the more superior side, is called the apex. Both lungs rub up against the rib cage, and in between them is an area called the mediastinum. The costal the costal surface, we know costal means rib. So the outside of the majority of what you think of as the lung is making direct contact, isn't it, with the thoracic cavity. So that would be the, the costal surface of the lung would be that which is making direct contact with the thoracic cavity. So just looking at this, we've seen something like this upstairs, apex, more superior, pointy portions of the lung, and then the base, which essentially was sitting right on the diaphragm. So the diaphragm would be this big old muscle, right? The diaphragm would be down here, big old muscle down here, and the two lungs sitting right on top of the diaphragm. We see that both lungs have an oblique fissure, right? That's going to divide the lobes, and then only the right lung additionally has a horizontal fissure, which gives you the upper, middle, and lower lobes. From the medial view, now I think you can better appreciate the idea of a hilum. Notice that there's a very limited area into which everything exits or enters the lung. So just like the hilum of the kidney, here's the hilum of the lung. You see the pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary veins, and the bronchi. Uh, passing in and out. There would also be lymphatic and nerve structures and uh, passing in and out there as well. 
you know this story from lab one, and that is that the lungs are surrounded by a serous membrane called the pleura. There are two layers to that serous membrane, the visceral and the parietal layers. The visceral layer, remember, is shrink wrapped to the surface of the lung itself. I don't know if Mr. Mueller did this, but I always over uh, blow up the lungs, if you will, really bring them to their maximum. And if you do that, if you bring the air into the lungs tonight or last week, and you really overdo it, you'll start seeing the pleura pop. You'll see the visceral pleura kind of bubble up off the lung surface. So if he didn't do that with you last week or watch for it tonight, but you'll see this little very, very thin, very translucent layer kind of pop off the lung when you really overstretch them, and that's some of that visceral pleura. There's also the parietal pleura, and we know that that's the lining of the thoracic wall. And in between, we know this, there's going to be some fluid in there in what's called the pleural cavity. It's going to be liquid. Um, it's going to help minimize the friction. If, there, if this fluid wasn't there, every time we breathed, then there could be friction, which would build up heat. Right? So we wouldn't want that heat building up as we breathe. So this helps to minimize that friction and heat buildup. That would be pleurisy, wouldn't it? Well, pleurisy would be an inflammation of, pleurisy would be an inflammation of the, um, of the pleural cavity, basically. Now, what happens if you, well, we'll get to this in a minute. I'll, I'll finish my thought here in a second. Here is a cartoon representation of the layers. So we have the beautiful pink lung. The layer right on top of it Right, shrink wrap to it, that would be the visceral pleura. And then we're looking at the second layer, that would be the layer attached to the thoracic cavity itself, that would be the parietal pleura. And in between those, there's a space, and that would be the, the pleural space filled with some fluid. If you zoom in, there's a, there's, a, there's a sound again. If you zoom in, right, now we can see that double layer. So long visceral layer, parietal layer, okay? I need my sound effects, so thank you, okay. Um, it makes sense, what I'm about to say, that the lungs are going to have a lot of lymphatic activity, a lot of lymphatic uh, structure. We talked about the lymph nodes a little bit, and you know that lymph nodes are found in the body in places where there are possible invaders. So there's a lot of lymph nodes in the inguinal region. There's a lot of lymph nodes in the cervical region. There's a lot of lymph nodes lining your intestine. And a special word for that was malt. Remember that term? Uh, Mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue. Well, it also makes sense that you would want a lot of lymph nodes and lymph activity around your lungs because you're breathing in all this crap all the time, right? So you're bringing in cells and bacteria. So you want a very robust lymphatic system catching all those things that come into your lung. So a lot of lymph nodes along your lung and along your pleura and along your bronchi. They're going to be ca catching the dust and the pollen and all the stuff that comes in that doesn't get filtered by the other structure. So here, again, all the green that you see in this image are lymph nodes and lymphatic vessels. And there's, there's, quite, a rich, there's quite a rich lymphatic involvement here. So you see lots of lymph nodes along the bronchi right, throughout the lung, perfusing through the lung, right, picking up particles. Um, but this is also a problem. Um, I may have mentioned, I'm sure I have, that cancer cells like to travel, they like to metastasize through lymphatic vessels, right? So cancer cells typically spread. And so, yes, we have a lot of lymphatic involvement with the lung. That's a good thing. It catches all the crap and helps our immune system. But a person who has a lung cancer, it can metastasize out of the lung very easily because you have all these routes, all these ways for those cells to break off and start traveling. So we know that individuals with primary lung cancer, that lung cancers tend to metastasize to certain places. They tend to go in predictable ways. Other individuals may have a bone cancer, and we know that that bone cancer may metastasize to the lung. So again, there's a lot of in and out routes, if you will, leaving and, and entering the lung, which make them an unfortunate uh, place to catch cancer. 
right? So secondary cancers, metastasized cancers, leave and enter the lung quite easily because of all this activity. There's a name for this. If you come across this term, I told you that in the gut, the extra lymphatic tissue is called malt, mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue. It's not labeled here, but around the bronchi, you'll see it called BALT, bronchial or bronchi-associated lymphatic tissue. So this extra oomph of lymphatic structure is called BALT in some books. The last little bit, really, is going to be about how is it that we get air into our lungs. So you're sitting there right now. You're kind of relaxed. You're breathing. As you inspire, you're not having to blow out birthday candles or anything. So you're just kind of breathing in and out, very little bit. And as you are breathing in, your diaphragm is usually kind of dome-shaped. You'll see this in the cartoons in a moment. Diaphragm at relax at a relaxed state is kind of a domed structure. And as you inhale, the diaphragm is tightening. As it tightens, it tends to flatten out. So that means that what are you doing? You're making your thoracic cavity larger. And also, as you breathe in, your ribs are going to go out a little bit. Your sternum's going to go out a little bit. So what you're really doing is expanding your thoracic cavity. Now, the lungs follow that because, remember, the lungs are kind of shrink-wrapped to the thoracic wall. You've got that pleura, you've got that visceral layer and that th parietal layer. I think of it as a shrink-wrap, and it's a vacuum seal, if you will. So as you gently expand your thoracic cavity, the lungs will expand with it. I mentioned that whole pressure thing earlier, and we'll talk a greater deal next semester, but if the volume of your thoracic cavity increases, then the pressure in there goes down. Okay? So as you increase the volume of your thoracic cavity, the pressure goes down. Well, as the pressure goes down, atmospheric pressure, the air in the atmosphere, then will rush into the place of least resistance and will go to your lungs because there's less pressure there. That's how you get air. Right? That's how your oxygen comes rushing into your lungs. Your chest expands a little bit. Air comes rushing in. Gas exchange happens. When you're sitting there at rest, you only have to use your muscles to inspire. Expiration is passive. It just kind of happens. It's the relaxation of those same muscles. That's when you're just sitting there breathing normally, in and out, very quietly, no stress, kind of parasympathetic, relaxed. So we're going to elevate the ribs a little bit. We're going to uh, expand the sternum. We're going to move the diaphragm down. All of that, like I said, is going to help uh, open up the rib cage. Now, there's some muscles that I'm going to list here. If we didn't learn them in 105 in the lab, I'm not going to ask you to know these muscles. So there's a couple in here that are unfamiliar to you. They'll make more sense next semester. But the scalenes are these muscles that are in your neck. And um, they can help to pull up your first and second rib, and that would also expand your overall thoracic cavity. There are the intercostal muscles. You've seen those. The muscles between your ribs, they'll be a part of this as well. And there are other muscles that we're not going to deal with. Now, if you are trying to breathe more actively, you are at a birthday party, or you're, going to be, you're the birthday boy, and you're going to be blowing out the candles and you need to take in that big, deep breath, there are definitely additional muscles that you're going to recruit that are going to help you to really open up your chest. And then when you go to blow out that birthday cake, candle, you're definitely going to squeeze muscles that you didn't use before to try to empty out and forcefully push air out that you didn't normally do, right? When you're just breathing, you don't push it out. But if you're blowing out that candle across the room, you're going to push, and you're even going to use your rectus abdominis, and you're even going to use your latissimus dorsi, and you're going to use all sorts of muscles to really squeeze and push and push that air up and out of your thoracic cavity. Your pec minor, right? We, we saw the pectoralis minor. That could get involved. Your sternocleidomastoid, even the muscles of your neck, right? When people blow out candles, they get kind of funny looking. They kind of get stressed out. You see all kinds of muscles you wouldn't normally see come out. Um, so this is a very simple idea here. Uh, here we're seeing an x-ray on the right. 
The black regions are air. Uh, X-rays are a negative image. So the bones are showing up as white things, the structure. So here's the heart. Oops, can't draw white on white now, can I? So the heart's kind of over here. And the black spaces are just air-filled spaces. So here you are inhaling. So notice that the muscles of the neck are going up, kind of opening up the space. The sternum's going to go out. The diaphragm's going to undome, flatten out a little bit. The ribs are going to elevate a little bit. And basically, you're going to inhale. And then you're going to exhale. And if you look at these pictures back to back, to back there's a lot more black space in here, right? A lot more air, if you will, in this lung because it's, in, it's inhaled. And in the next picture, as we exhale, there's less black over here in the, in the x-ray. And when you exhale, again, the muscles are all going back to where they were. It, it's not difficult. I don't want to insult you. This is not difficult. And the muscles um, are ones, many of them, that you know about. This picture also is not meant to insult you. The same idea, though. As you increase the space of the thoracic cavity, then air comes in. And then when you exhale, you're decreasing that space. This is showing what your ribs are actually moving, too. So as you breathe in, your ribs are kind of opening and closing a little bit, um, attached to the sternum. And um, it's kind of neat to watch this, but here someone is inhaling, and you can see how the sternum actually goes out. And then when you're exhaling, right, the air, the sternum kind of comes back in. This is the sternum here. So your ribs are, you know, there's a little bit of movement there with the ribs. Okay, last question for you, last five minutes here. Is breathing voluntary or involuntary? Is breathing involuntary or voluntary? Both. Kind of both, and I, I'm with you there, right? Yeah. We certainly can choose to hold our breath for a short while. We can certainly choose to take in a bigger breath or blow out the birthday cake candle. We, we have some control over it. That control is voluntary. We can consciously choose to do, use these muscles. But thankfully, breathing is also very autonomic. Right? We can go to sleep and know that we're going to breathe, hopefully, through the night. So the brain does send a signal to the muscles of respiration, keeping them going. Right? So it's very much controlled by the autonomic nervous system. I love it when little kids say, I'm just going to hold my breath. <gasps> go for it. Right? Because at some point, your brain is going to say, hey, dummy, breathe. Even no matter how, how willful you try to hold your breath, your brain will send a signal involuntarily forcing you to inhale. And hopefully when that happens, you're above water. Right? So you, you just can't, you cannot willfully stop yourself from breathing. Your brain will take over. We'll talk about the mechanisms and the control of that next semester. But if you're not breathing, your body's still making CO2. And that CO2 is going to make your blood more acidic. And we'll talk about that whole process next semester. But at some point, your brain's going to say, hey, breathe, dummy. When it does so, it's going to send signals down from your brain stem, specifically from your medulla oblongata and your pons. So we would say that, remember, that's the brain stem area. It's not your consciousness. It's in your brain stem and your involuntary part of your brain. And uh, let's zoom in to the brain a little bit, and take a look, and uh, just to get your bearings, cerebellum, pons, medulla oblongata. And those are the areas that are responsible for sending signals to you to breathe. Back in the nervous system, as I was describing to you the more basic parts of the brain, we went up the brain stem, we went up the medulla and the oblongata, and we went up the pons, and then we finally got to cerebellum. It was in the brain stem that I said, this is the area that's in charge of your consciousness and of your breathing and of your heart rate, things like that. Those signals certainly do come down and influence your voluntary muscles. Absolutely, right? Your autonomic nervous system is sending signals to your muscles of respiration. So like I said, better make sure you're above water when that happens. So as we always finish up, perfect timing here, I think. Um, what happens to the respiratory system as we get older? It's going to become a little less efficient, and there are going to be some changes to the lungs. They'll become less elastic in the pluck. I mean, everyone loves that pluck. It just is so soothing to sit there and, 
and massage that long. It's so elastic and so spongy. But as we get older, that long gets a little bit less spongy, a little bit less compliant, and that's going to make it more difficult for it to expand. So even when you open your thoracic cavity, the lungs won't expand quite so easily. And that's going to lead to less gas exchange with each and every breath. Now, how is the body going to adjust to that? If you're not getting as much air with each breath, the brain still needs oxygen, so the body's going to start making you breathe more often. So you're going to start breathing a little bit faster as you get older. Your respiration rate will go a little bit faster as you get older. Um, emphysema, uh, common, unfortunately a common disease, um, oftentimes caused by smoking, but not necessarily. Um, emphysema, though, is a lack or a loss of alveoli. Think about this for a second. You have 300 to 400 million little air sacs. If you look at a lung with emphysema, you see big air sacs, big, big air sacs. And you think, oh, well, that's fine. They just have bigger air sacs. But somewhere in middle school, you learned that the surface area of a bunch of little spheres is far greater than the surface area of fewer big spheres. So in emphysema, you've got these big alveoli, but their surface area is reduced. And so you don't have as much opportunity for gas exchange. So these individuals start huffing and puffing by just walking across the room because they can't get the gases into their body like they need to. Lastly, um, um, one thing that does accumulate is that with age, right, especially if you live in a polluted society or work in, a, in, a, in an environment where you're getting asbestos or black dust or some sort of uh, materials into your lungs, those materials do slowly begin to accumulate. Well, the lymph nodes start getting that stuff and clearing it. The macrophages can get rid of it. But after a long time, those pollutants can start to irritate the cells and lead to cancerous type changes. And so with age and with pollution and with smoke and other things like that, that can definitely lead to uh, diseases of the lung. And that brings us right at 545 to the end of the respiratory system. So that's your respiratory system. The mastering assignment for the respiratory system is posted for you. So I know you've got five or six days. I know that you want to enjoy turkey and your family and wherever it is you're going or the extra hours that you're working, whatever. But please do not completely blow off this course over the next week. You could blow off your mastering assignment, but don't blow off getting ready for the lab exam. And there is, remember, a PALS quiz on mastering. So when you're in mastering, you look in the calendar for mastering, it's going to say the PALS quiz is due on Thursday, December 4th. But what that means is that it's there until December 4th for the people who have lab on Thursday. You should take that PALS quiz before you go to lab, and it's to help you get ready for lab. Okay, so make sure you do the PALS quiz over the break and um, focus on the lab practical, and then I'll see you all next Tuesday. Have a wonderful break. Be safe.